I'm Joel Cheryl. I'm the Artems maintainer. I'm also one of the original developers. Many of you have emailed me over the years, and um, for this is the first time I actually get to give a presentation, and I have taken the Artems, what is Artems, down to one slide because most of you already know, and if you don't, just come out and talk to us. I should mention Mark, who's also here, was one of the original uh, four and a half person team who developed Artems, so we've been doing this together a long time. The, um, it's just a free open source embedded real-time operating system. It's currently has got about 15 architect processor architectures and about 150 board support packages. And a quick grab of images of different projects that have used it doesn't even begin to cover it. Um, we got two really nice things last month. Um, RBSP launched and Curiosity landed. So, but we're on a, a lot of missions, um, mainly thanks to you guys and thanks for using us. I mean, that's the important thing because there would be no reason to even still be a project if it wasn't for all the things that you guys used it on. Um, so, for the, if you want to know more about Artems itself as what it is and what capabilities it has, we can talk offline. But what I'm going to really do is talk more about how we're community driven, uh, what's going on in the community, what kind of things would we like to see happen, you know, how can, um, how do we manage branches, and a little bit on what kind of services uh, we actually offer. The <clears throat> first thing to note is that after this many years of being available as an open source project, it's, hope it's clear to everyone that we wouldn't exist unless we had users, and we want happy users. So features get added because people want them. People either ask for them and sponsor their development, they are interested in having something on um, that they need. Um, MMS has paid for uh, dynamic loading to be added and for a file system to meet their specifications for um, future use. There's um, a lot of things have been added. Most bug reports are actually from users. Artems has changed a lot over the past 20 years, but we still have compatibility with the 10 to 12 year old 4.6 version that a lot of you are actually still flying. Um, from the open source perspective and for community growth, it's very important to us to be involved in uh, student programs. We've been involved in the Google Summer of Code where for five years now we've had approximately 40 effectively summer interns working for us remotely. They have worked on a lot of things you actually care about. They have worked on issues like code coverage. They have worked on uh, scheduler refactoring. They have worked on uh, one of the other features we had two students work on is something we call arenas to add memory protection support. So you can take advantage of the features like the Leon 4 having the IO MMU separation on 4K boundaries. We should be able to provide uh, capability where the uh, you can lock down which tasks have access to which peripherals now. And our goal is not necessarily just to implement what's been implemented before. I mean, that particular thing is coming out of somebody's PhD research on what makes sense in, in an embedded system, and we want to know what makes sense to you. The struggle hard one is the Google code in. It's try to keep high school students actually doing something useful for the Artems project. We're not an easy project to find things to do, but we did manage to have done this the past two years, and we've had about 200 students. If you've got high school age kids or friends, they're doing this again over the uh, Thanksgiving and fall and break. Uh, we've applied. I don't know if we'll get in. It's very small. There's only going to be 10 this year. ESA has also done a summer of code in space. There, they, we got two students uh, over the past two years. They both have worked on co uh, test coverage and test improvements. The important thing to note is our temps can be as small as 16K depending on the architecture. Uh, depending on what you use as your minimum profile, the, like the Leon 3 is down into the 40K range. It's highly configurable, things uh, can be left out just by the linker. The important things to realize is that it's free. Um, it's best, our view of it is that we're like a, a national park. Uh, sometimes people have to pay to have things done. You want, to, you want the Boy Scouts to come in and clean the trail. You, you'd like a bench over there that looks out the waterfall. Well, somebody's got to buy the bench. But there's a little bit of maintenance. We're park rangers. That's really what our job is in relation to our Tim's. But if you want something done with our Tim's, it's really good to work with the community to sponsor a core developer. Um, OAR has relationships with almost um, all the core developers to uh, make sure they get work and get funding when we can pass it through. 
and just discussing things, even if you're going to do it completely on your own, if you discuss it and get feedback, it's very good. If you show up with something implemented and you took a left turn where we wanted you to take a right, you're going to be very disappointed when something doesn't get merged. The RTEMS file system from MMS, the runtime loader from MMS, that's a dynamic loader. Um, RTEMS file system actually supports block uh, devices that are not powers of two, which works on a lot of odd space hardware for uh, non-volatile memory. We've added symmetric multiprocessing. That was another user-sponsored activity. And we're in the middle of upgrading the TCP IP stack to, um, to support IPv6 and IPsec. One of the other things that comes with being a, a successful open source project with a long life is we have outlasted many of the things that um, we used initially. We've gone from CVS to Git in the past year. We've outlasted three web, uh, we're on our third website implementation. We are actually have the problem that, um, that, so where's the button for the light? Is it the? That one, okay. I mean, we're newer than a lot of things. People didn't use things like Doxygen or Javadocs. They didn't exist when we started. So we've gone back and, re and made sure the comments are actually in forms that are more usable. Um, there's an effort now to have continuous integration with a build bot. So every time a change is checked in, there's a, it's completely rebuilt and there's um, test results archived forever. This kind of technology just simply did not exist when we started the project, but we want to take advantage of it. So, you know, we've got a new website. We've, we actually, whoops, we transitioned from CVS to Git, and that was very, um, very complicated. It involved, a, it was easier to do than it was to retrain all the users who had lots of history. We had 17 years of public history in, Git, in CVS, and we preserved that. But that gives us atomic change sets. It also makes it easier for you to track RTEMS and merge your own changes uh, independently. Because you usually do custom BSPs, custom drivers, and you're not going to submit them. And honestly, nobody else but you is interested in your FPGA. It's important to you, but it doesn't go into an open source project. One of the new features that I am really proud of is as preparation for doing the symmetric multiprocessing, we added a pluggable scheduler framework. You can replace the thread scheduling algorithm in RTEMS. You can write your own. So we have the first algorithm is the deterministic priority scheduler. This is the one RTEMS has always had, executes in constant time. We have a nice, simple priority scheduler, which is a low memory, very simple. We have a classic earliest deadline first, and now we have a constant bandwidth. Um, server scheduler with a quality of service library which can allow you to say that certain threads won't make their period and you can request them not to, to uh, even try because you know that they, they, they can't complete their, their deadline because they have more computation left. These, those, these are uniprocessor schedulers. There's room to add more. We also have a, a, a symmetric multiprocessor scheduler. But the good thing is and that I'm also really proud of, we have a scheduler simulator so you actually can write your own scheduling algorithm and decide how threads are allocated. And as we start moving into uh, multi-core and symmetric multiprocessing, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about how difficult the challenges are. And, and as we learn more about scheduling real-time real systems in space, you've got issues like low, do, if I want to take a core offline, what does that do to my scheduling? Do I want to, you know, um, other factors that we haven't even considered that we'll think about when we start fielding. The symmetric multiprocessing support supports has been tested on up to four cores on a Leon 3, and I think it's been uh, tested on an eight core PC, uh, a PC. We had a GSOC student who added support for the ARM. Um, that's pending merger at the moment. So really this is one of those places where the basic work was done. Um, we're very conservative and we like to point out that um, it has not been fielded. It needs the kind of review and stuff that makes it fielded. And it's an opportunity for other targets like the PowerPC. It's, um, the scheduler was designed to add processor affinity to. And of course, there's alternative SMP scheduling algorithms available. In the interest of uh, a long lifespan product, we actually re-architected the time representation. Now we can represent, we use 64-bit counter for nanoseconds since uh, the POSIX epoch. That gives us over 500 years till overflow. 
which is a very nice thing to have as you've got long life missions. 2038 is not that long from now, and that's when the uh, standard 32-bit number of seconds in, in, in uh, POSIX overflows. There is always new activity. Uh, there's the Spark 64, the V9. The NEC V850 is an automotive pro processor. There's some user activity on bringing up a microblaze port, but there's um, been a lot of work related to improvements in existing ports, and I was surprised that we had actually had 40 new board support packages added in about the last 18 months. One of the things I was really surprised, a lot of you was, hadn't heard about when I mentioned it, we actually do um, non-instrumented instruction level test coverage at near 100%. We measure the generated instructions to see if our tests execute them or do not execute them, and we measure whether the branches generated at the assembly level are taken or not taken. For what I can, the operating system proper, we're really high. Uh, in other spots, it, is, it depends on what area capability, but for the most part, it's all over 90% on what we'd consider core and core file system code at this point. Those results are all publicly available. You can reproduce them yourself, and that's a very important thing. This is an ongoing effort. Uh, we really haven't had any feedback. We've used um, uh, summer code and ESA students, sponsored students. The, we can output in GCOF format if you'd like to use the analysis tools from the, that support that. There's initial support for getting uh, using the GNU perf format to get to do performance analysis. Uh, one thing we don't know how to do is go from our assembly level trace information which is actually focused on taking every branch of every assembly instruction and guaranteeing that that does anything with MCDC or any other type of coverage rules. And we really don't have any feedback on what kind of reports would be interesting to you. Our TIMS has a port of, the, of a FreeBSD host USB stack now and can, rem, can actually support removable mass storage media. There is also, this is the foundation of the next effort, which is this TCPIP stack upgrade. So this is in the middle of uh, um, uh, probably toward the 90% completion point. And so we should be replacing this with a very modern, easily updated stack that works exactly like uh, any BSD networking uh, book will tell you it works. It is, that is a large project. Another very important thing that's going on is the, we added support for uh, the dynamic loading in the, st in the style of the POSIX calls for shared libraries, but it's very light on the host target. It was designed to meet the, cold, uh, the small cold fire requirements for the processor found on MMS. So it's like it will easily fit into two mega RAM, provide plenty of useful space for your application, and puts very, very low impact on your target. It was very specifically designed to meet the stringent requirements of, the, of a low memory, low processor overhead. Um, one of the things that you have to wonder is, when do we make releases? Well, the first thing is there's two halves of the RTEMS project. The first is the public project, and that's what most people see. The public project actually follows a very standard open source policy. There is a development head, there is a currently active release branch, and there is one older release branch. So if you think about Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS or Fedora, this is how all of them do it. Um, we try to get diminishing changes. We will not add features onto an old branch. But uh, these new features are very, very well tested and the test quality is high. The other thing I tell people that's not obvious, it's not just our test reports. For every major release, some user from some community who has really high either space medical or industrial testing requirements is asked if their project's testing in QA lines up with the RTEMS release schedule. If it does, they have to bless a release or a branch point before it happens. And um, MMS actually, uh, the, I think it's the 4.10.2 release, is actually the MMS release flight software version. That's why some of the projects have been going to MMS. So we use their, so they have a release which actually we synced up with them on. The other side of the, the house is that, well, there is a free, it is a free software project, but people have to work on it. That there's a few ways that OAR, who was one of the original developer, who was the original developer of RTEMS, how we make any money to fund 
continuing to maintain and distribute Artems as a free product. The first way is a support subscription, which basically allows you to get email answers to questions, help, development advice, things like that. We always will answer within two days. Um, we fix problems as quickly as possible, usually within a couple of hours of, of knowing about them. We'll find a workaround or a real fix. We'll, and we're used to being interacting with projects where everything's considered confidential, so it's not a, it's, that's what we do. The other thing which not a lot of people know, that's our normal support. The other thing that a lot of not a people not a lot of people have realized we do. We have legacy releases. Um, a lot of people in here probably have heard the infamous 466, which is a, a lot of people still fly. It's on a lot of missions. We actually have released three legacy versions past that, which have 54 bug fixes that have been backported. So if people are still interested in those older versions, as long as they're interested, we'll keep, keep doing it. So it's very important to us to just make sure that we meet user needs. That's really the only reason that Artems continues to exist. You guys use it, it works well for you. We, we want you to succeed. We're very proud of actually being a part of the community. Artems was originally developed as a research part, uh, project for the US Army Missile Command, and the intention was to support government big science and to, get, and to have an open source product that would do that. We're still 20 years later trying to fulfill that mission. We really are on a continual effort to improve our processes. We don't wanna be just another, we, are, we aren't. We are not a, another open source project. We wanna be the tightest run, highest quality, highest tested, highest processed open source project, and we want our processes to be open to you guys and we want your feedback, because you really do have the expertise to help us do that. And really, we only continue to work on our Tim's because you, you like it, it works for you, and we keep helping you do, solve problems and make your systems work. And I'm honestly very proud, because I look around, I see all the missions, and August was a, was a good month, because you, you guys launched finally after Isaac, uh, Curiosity landed, there was a few, MMS is getting closer, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the in the community and it's always nice to hear about you guys because we're we're in it but we're we just watch <laughs> so I'm ready for any questions oh whew. it makes me nervous <laughs> he has asked the most <laughs> uh oh Oh, you, nice softball. One of the best things about working with the Google Summer Code and the Google Code In is it has focused us on being so approachable even though we're cross development for embedded. We, um, there are about four or five times a year we update a virtual machine image of CentOS that is capable of running uh, the Spark instruction simulator for the ERC32 and the PC simulator. So you can just download it and boot up and actually one of the things a lot of you've probably, I know I've seen a lot of faces, when I, I teach uh, an Artem's class a few times a year and we use the virtual machine also in that as a kickstart because we want you to learn how to use it. But the virtual machine is really good and it's helped a lot of students because I don't want them having to install a development environment. We'll spend a day or two doing that and they won't produce anything. So yes, we have a virtual machine It's in that low end, that low point of entry is really important for a hard project for us to be open source and have users. So that I don't think I cut the slide. They're actually of the 15 processor architectures we support. I think there is an open source free simulator for 14 of them. So you can actually run code on every architecture except one using completely free tools, which allows you to experiment, play with. Uh, with things easily with our Everything from networking to the graphics without having real hardware. <laughs>